Well, I'm Paul Webley. I'm the director of uh, SAIS, uh, and I'd like to welcome all of you in the audience tonight, particularly of those who've travelled a long way to be here. And I know that some people have travelled a very long way uh, to be here. So we have people who've come here from Delhi, for example, uh, and to Professor Philippe Collet's uh, mother, who I know is here somewhere. Uh, so, welcome. Uh, I was told that, um, that you haven't actually seen your son lecture. So uh, it should be a very interesting experience for you. Uh, we really appreciate you all taking the trouble to come here. Uh, it all adds to the occasion that is a SAIS inaugural. It's a ceremony, it's a rite de passage for the speaker, although I've been told that he was also not telling people that he'd been promoted to professor. So uh, maybe he needs a rite de passage to convince him that he is a professor now. It's a celebration and it's an enjoyable intellectual event for the whole SAIS community. Now, to make sure it's an enjoyable event, can I ask you please to turn off your mobile phones? Um, that's something I invariably get wrong myself, so let's just do that. My problem is not normally turning it off, it's remembering to turn it back on again afterwards. Okay, right, there we go. And I'm always, always told that I should tell you where the fire exits are, and uh, not very surprisingly, they're the exits that say fire exit. Now, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this particular inaugural lecture. It's the third inaugural of this academic session. We've got a long tradition at SAIS uh, of serious expertise in water. But to my shame, I know little of Philippe Coulet's work, so I'm really looking forward to hearing more about water law, reforms in India, and the opportunities and apprehensions these are engendering. Professor Coulet will be introduced by Dr. Usha Ramanathan. She's an internationally recognized expert on law and poverty, uh, she studied law at Madras University, the University of Nagpur, and Delhi University, and she's a research fellow at the Centre for the Study of Developing Societies. She's also South Asia editor of the Law, Environment and Development Journal. She's co-edited two books with uh, Philippe Coulet, and she's also written with him, so I can't think of anyone better suited to do the introduction. Uh, she's also flown in specially from Delhi to do this introduction, so thank you very much indeed. At the end of the, the vote of thanks will be given by Professor Andreas Philippopoulos Nikolopoulos of the University of Westminster. Andreas read law in Thessaloniki, Greece, as well as many other European cities, as far as I can see. Completed his LMM at King's and his PhD at Birkbeck. He's written widely in the areas of environmental law, human rights, and postmodern jurisprudence. He's the co-director of the Westminster International Law and Theory Centre. And I should tell you that just before the inaugural, he came in dressed completely differently and had to get changed because he'd be doing some interesting event involving place and law that meant he had to dress comfortably. Uh, I suggest we all ask him about it in the uh, reception afterwards. When we finish that, uh, there will be a reception upstairs in the Brunei Gallery to which your Brunei Gallery suite, to which you're all invited. So we're very grateful to Usha and Andreas for taking part in this event. And to introduce Professor Kulohi, I'm now going to pass over to Usha. Thank you much indeed. This is really a signal honor. It's great to have a friend who gives you an opportunity to say publicly what you think of him. So thank you, Philippe. <laughs> and I know that reaching the position of professor takes years of hard work. And I suspect he did that so that I would have this moment. So thanks again. Uh, I was just thinking what one can say to explain what Philippe is, because I know that uh, Academically, there'll be lots of you who, who've watched him here who know what he is and what he does. His students will know how he teaches. His colleagues will know his collaborative abilities. But there are a number of things that he does when many of you are not watching. So I thought I'll tell you about some of those things. Uh, he's, you know, there are some things that we've... Uh, what is it that makes for a good researcher? Because as a teacher, you watch him here, and I've watched him as a researcher quite, uh, quite closely worked with him quite closely over the years. And there are some things that we had to start off with. We, we would say that there are two things that you require when you're, when you're in any kind of work of this kind. Uh, one is education, and the other is instinct. Sometimes you don't have the instinct, and you've got to develop an instinct, and you might have to develop it through education. 
But education alone is never enough. We find that you always have to work yourself into an instinct uh, before you can deliver anything worthwhile. With Philippe, from the first time that I met him, which is many, many years ago, and I've grown old having known him. So, I mean, he hasn't grown old. I've grown old knowing him. Uh, all these years, I found that both education and instinct have been there uh, as much as was needed for every bit of work that was done, that he's, that he's done. The uh, early years when we watched him at work doing, uh, you know, working in collaboration with a group that was, that was uh, working against the building of the Sardar Sarovar Dam, uh, it, it was very interesting to watch how an academic could get into movement, could understand movement politics, work with them, uh, and yet not compromise his academic uh, quality, the quality of his work. It's, it's, it's retained its purity. And I, I must say that I particularly find it fascinating because I've never succeeded in doing it. Every time I begin, it becomes a campaign. And Philippe has never allowed uh, his uh, commitment to what he sees as right in the field to color the way in which he does his academics. And that's actually, we've had a number of questions that have arisen from watching Philippe and Philippe's colleagues work. And, uh, just to give an instance, I mean, there are, uh, we've had discussions on who is, a, who is an academic. What does an academic do? Is an academic a mere spectator? Uh, can an academic be an activist and still be a good academic? Is an academic a lender of words and voice? Uh, is an academic a chronicler? Uh, is, it, is an academic a biographer of experience? Is an academic a footnote? Can a person be an academic without a footnote? Uh, is an academic someone who aspires to be many footnotes. And uh, uh, I think what Philippe has done through these years is a mix of many of these things without getting obsessed with the footnotes, but yet having many footnotes in the work that he does. And it's been, I think that's, it's been a learning process for many of us. I must also say that uh, it's, it's very difficult to be a multitasker when you're an academic. I don't know how, how you find it, but it's, Usually, you know, when you think you've got your thinking cap on, it's difficult to do practical things. Uh, with Philippe, it's never been a problem. And I think maybe the most, uh, uh, most scary thing for me to watch uh, was to watch him write the book that he did on intellectual property. Uh, there was this window, and you could see the sunrise and the moon rise from, through that window. And he sat at a table from where you could see the sun and the moon rise at different parts of the day, at times of the day, of course. And uh, he would get up every once in a while to go into the kitchen to make the dessert for the evening. And in between, he finished a book. And it's, a, it's the first book on intellectual property in, that we had in, the, in Indian academia. It was accessible in terms of reading, readability, and it was written between desserts. <laughs> so that kind of tells you what Philippe is. I must also let you into a little secret for those who don't know that he makes the best chocolate cake in the world. So if you, you know, if, apart from reading his books, if you want something more, you know where to go. There is, uh, uh, it's not very easy to work in another country when, uh, when you get, where you may get viewed as a foreigner very often, and you keep going there, and the new people who meet you still think you're a foreigner. Uh, Philip speaks Hindi with ease, and he understands all the Hindi that there is to understand. But it's always, I mean, I've watched him learning patience. He's not a very patient chap, but he's had to learn his patience every time somebody comes up to him and tries being kind to him because he's a foreigner who doesn't understand what's happening around him. And he could explain to them the politics of the place. Uh, I think India helped him learn, pol uh, learn patience through not knowing very often that he knew more about India than we thought he did. But what's been useful you know, when I've watched him in India, what's been very useful is that this is one, one person who's been able to be multi-continental with remarkable ease and to carry the experiences across continents, both ways, you know, bringing it from Europe to Asia and then collaborating with Africa and doing it like it's the most natural thing to do. So, uh, like they say, you know, sometimes the award does the person proud, and sometimes the person does the award proud. I think Soas can rest assured that, you know, he's done you proud by being professor here. Uh, just a last thing, that when uh, Philippe would come quite frequently to India to do his research, you know, between all the work that he was doing here, 
And I think his mother got curious at one point about why he was going so frequently to India. And, and he came, she came there to find out. Uh, after spending two weeks, uh, she went with him to many of the places that, uh, that he took her to. And then she came back, and at the end of the two weeks, she said, I came here to find out why my son is constantly coming here. And I think I'm going back more confused. She says, a country full of anarchy. It's, you know, you can't, the languages are odd. It's an odd place. And then she paused for a moment, and then she said, but I think I understand one reason why he comes here. It's because there are so many people who love him so much. And I think that's true. He's about the best friend you can have. And it's a, it's a friendship that is not only about the social him, but he's able to share all his, uh, all that he learns. And a, a lot of the learning that he does, it's a mix of the professional and the social, and there's very little gap between the two. I'm impressed that SOAS has the capacity to appreciate this merging of the person with the professional, with the political. I think that's, it really speaks very well for the institution. And I'm glad that Philippe is here, uh, where he can be appreciated for the kind of person that he is and the work that he does. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, all of you, for being here. Um, thank you to the people of the stage, or the people who are robed like me, okay, who are probably better robed than me, it seems. <laughs> um, but uh, before I forget, uh, one person that also needs to be thanked is uh, Payal, who is hiding somewhere behind here for organizing this event, uh, for robing me as well. So that doesn't <laughs> seem to, <laughs> maybe it won't last the whole lecture. Um, and as we were just discussing, I just discovered that I chose the right university for doing my PhD because I have a nicer robe than some of the, the other people on the stage. I didn't know that until today. Um, okay, <laughs> beyond that, the re when I was asked to do this lecture, I was told I had to find something which was suitable for a mixed audience, for people working on water, people working on law, people who would, might not be working on anything at all related to what I do. And, okay, I've, I chose water for a variety of reasons, so I'll just start by explaining that in two seconds. First of all, I hope that we can all relate to water because water is, after all, something that concerns us, concerns us directly on a daily basis, even though I understand that the kind of concerns that we have here have nothing to do with the kind of concerns that I'll, I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail in India. <laughs> it's definitely not <laughs> staying. Um, secondly, and while I know there are some people in the audience who, um, who are very much within that field, um, there has been a lot of work on water, including in India, in various spheres, but it so happens that there has been very little work on water law. That's true at the international level, it's much more true in India, where there has really been virtually no work happening for a long time. And that's where I'll bring back Usha into the picture, because I also need to say my <laughs> two bits about Usha. The reason why Usha is here and the reason why it made a lot of sense for her to be here is not just because she's seen me growing up in a sense for many years academically and otherwise. It's also because she is one of the very few people in India who have actually engaged with water law for many years. And I know I need to qualify that immediately because she'll say she doesn't work on water law per se, which may be true on a daily basis. But first of all, she's one of the few people who were working on water law many years ago, I won't say so that it doesn't sound like it's too many years ago. Um, and she's, she's one of the very few people, if not the only person I have met over the past number of years that I have now been working on water law in India, who can engage not just with the law as it is on the books, that probably many people can, but with the underlying concept and 
the, the broader framework within which water law falls. So despite not working on water law itself, she's definitely the one person I would have wanted to call from an academic perspective only if I had had to choose in, from that perspective. Um, okay, there's, there's another reason why I chose to speak on water law, which is that it's since uh, I started working on it about in 2004, and there again, Usha is directly related to this because one day we were both called, I think, I think we got an email from a colleague with whom we had been working for a long time in the context of dams, again, the same Narmada dams Usha talked about. And he came up and said, there are all these things happening from a law perspective and we are not understanding what's happening, can you help us? Uh, at that point, I think neither of us had any ideas that there was a whole churning of new water laws happening. It was in front of us, it was all official laws coming up, but absolutely nobody had taken notice, either in terms of law, activists, research, whatever it may be, apart from people who were passing these laws, there was really no one understanding the broader dimensions behind what was happening. So since uh, I started that work, completely by chance in a sense, uh, it's had a, it's, it has had a way of taking over my life, and I guess by now, I, as uh, I think Usha keeps joking, that I work water law and I dream water law at night. That it's, it's a good sign that I don't dream water law at night, but it's more or less uh, reached that stage where, because there are so few people working on water law, it seems that given the number of issues that are taking place, there is more and more of a demand for doing more work, doing more work in that field. So that's kind of what's happened. That's one of the reasons why I guess I chose also to talk about this today. Now, lastly, before I move on, I just also wanted to make the connection with uh, SOAS in the sense that the kind of work I'm presenting to you is, in a sense, a reflection of my own understanding of what SOAS is. And the reason why that's happened is for two reasons. One of them, uh, because that wasn't mentioned earlier, but I just mentioned it to, to make the link. The reason why I first went to India, the first time I went to India is because I, I did a master here, and the only thing I heard about was India, so one fine day I decided to go to India. So that's how I first put my finger into the country. So it was really directly related to my experience at SOAS. And it's also the same time I spent at SOAS in the first place, which taught me that despite the fact that I had done a law degree in Switzerland, which really didn't look like there was any prospect for doing anything with law in the future. It's when I came here that I realized that there was indeed a lot I could do without necessarily having to go and look for another field to expand my horizons. So in effect, hopefully, what, um, what I'm talking about tonight is really the reflection of the changes that were brought about by SOAS, and the, my SOAS experience as a student, though obviously I'm sure that's been uh, changed uh, a lot in the meantime. Um, okay, so water law, that's something which is um, an experience indirectly for all of us on a daily basis. It's first of all drinking water, that's obvious. Um, in India, it's a struggle for the overwhelming majority of the people on a daily basis, specifically for the over overwhelming majority of women. But even for the small percentage of the population within urban areas that has access to piped water supply, water is still a concern, even though a more distant concern, because supply is not assured on a daily basis to the extent that one might want. So in a sense, water as, in, in a sense of drinking water, is a concern, not in the same way that uh, we understand here, and so a much more direct concern. It's also a concern when moving to a broader uh, scale in terms of environmental issues because water pollution or environmental pollution that has impacts on water ecosystems is increasingly becoming an issue that affects people in their daily lives. Maybe first of all farmers, but a much broader range of people as well. Finally, that links up all the way to the international level and that's probably true for many countries around the world, but it's specifically true in India, where the international dimension of water sharing, whether with Pakistan or with Bangladesh, so whether um, in both very different contexts, 
is an issue which um, matters at the policy making level, which turns into uh, legal conflict once in a while. So it's from the very local to the national level, water is an issue that um, makes up that's part of the fabric of policy making at all levels. Now, okay. the, what I want to focus on for tonight to simplify or to narrow down the scope is specifically on drinking water because that's the easiest entry point and to link that with groundwater as well. So I'll just start with um, a, a couple of minutes of context just so that uh, I'm sure we're all on the same level in terms of the issues I want to bring up later on. Access to drinking water, in specifically in rural areas, um, in principle, official figures tell us that everyone has access to water, but even governmental figures recognize that more or less 70 percent get access to sufficient clean water, and so both um, have to be taken together. Just as a matter of record, sufficient water, as of now in terms of policy norms, is 40 liters per capita per day. Now, what are the reasons for insufficient access for the 30 percent that I recognize as having not sufficient access to water yet. One may be absence of infrastructure, and again, in principle, that only very few people today who do not have access to any hand pumps or any other source of water in the vicinity of the place where they live. A much more serious concern in terms of the numbers that are affected are falling water tables, which means that there may be a hand pump, but the water table may have fallen, which means that the hand pump has dried up. So that's typically a case where it would look like people have access, but in practice there is no water. Um, there are issues of restrictions, both in terms of social norms and economic factors. So economic factors, it's to simplify simply the cost. Social norms in India that would be specifically caste issues. And while we would hope that caste-related uh, discriminations, inequalities in access to water are going away or have been going away for the past several decades, uh, this is just a case that I can't resist mentioning just to show that it's really a present concern. Just a few weeks ago, and that's something I read in the paper, so I don't know more about the case, a um, young man from the state of Haryana had his hand cut off for having drunk water from the water pot of someone from a higher caste. So it's not a theoretical concern, it's still a very practical concern, this issue of social, um, the, the social dimension of access to water. Finally, there is the problem which is the most, uh, one of the most significant in terms of the number of people that get affected on an increasing basis and it's the declining quality of water. You may have access to water, but it may not be uh, uh, deemed clean according to the standards in place. The other factors I wanted to mention at the outset is that there are issues of lack of access uh, that are caused by insufficient availability of water, but as particularly in terms of drinking water, there is no question of an actual physical scarcity of water. Drinking water only takes between five and 10 figures, one sees usually a 7% of overall water consumption. So the issue is really not in terms of not having enough water to provide everyone the 40 or 70 liter per capita per day, but it's more all the other issues uh, among which I've highlighted a few just here. In terms of groundwater, what needs to be mentioned is that it's become the major source of drinking water for everyone. It's about 80% of the population that's now, uh, that now provides itself through groundwater, drinking water, uh, something that's dramatically changed over the past few decades. Similarly, for other users of water, groundwater is becoming an increasing source of water, and that's the case, for instance, for bottling plants, and bottling plants are one of the issues I want to get back to in a minute. Now, there are a multiplicity of conflicts related to drinking water linked directly or indirectly to the rules in place. One of them is the, the problem linked to the fact that it is landowners that have control over groundwater, which means that access to the wells, hand pumps or whatever that may be, situated on private land are regulated or mediated by the landowners, which again will, will be a an issue not necessarily directly in legal terms, but in the case of caste equations, for instance. A second, um, maybe less um, visible conflict is the, the question of disconnections. 
These connections can happen in cities when the utility uh, disconnects someone's water supply because they haven't paid their bills. That's very straightforward in the sense that it's the utility does it um, directly. In rural areas, we get the same phenomenon, but in an indirect way, which is that for people who get waters through, hand, uh, through uh, bore wells, for instance, in case they do not manage to pay the electricity bill or for any other reason, electricity gets disconnected, then uh, access to water gets disconnected automatically. But the link is not made, for instance, between um, the lack of access to electricity and the realization of the human right to water. Now, these conflicts are conflicts which are largely invisible at the policy-making level because largely they affect mostly the poor, they affect individuals, they do not affect people um, in, um, in large number at the same time. So these are the conflicts in, in effect that are the most interesting and that are the one I want to bring out to you because they're the ones that do not get discussed either academically or in policy terms. Now, the, the, there are obviously also lots of visible conflicts, much more visible conflicts concerning drinking water. And just two examples of that I'll take in terms of large-scale conflicts. One is the case of the state of Delhi, okay, so city-state, uh, which has an increasing, ever-increasing, burgeoning population, and the state needs to find water to um, provide drinking water to its population. Since it's a city-state, it doesn't have um, access to drinking water, to water beyond what falls under its territory. Hence, it, it is in a permanent state of negotiation and conflict with neighboring states in terms of accessing sufficient water to provide the drinking water. The second case is a case going back to the Narmada dams that have already been mentioned. Uh, specifically in the case of the Sardar Sarovar Dam in the state of Gujarat, but which happens to be a multi and interstate uh, project. The rationale for the dam has been evolving over time. At this point, one of the main justification for the dam is the provision of drinking water to hundreds of villages in the drier part of the state of Gujarat. What's interesting here is that all the conflicts related to the dam, and there have been many over many years, from displacement related issues, uh, probably three to 400,000 people displaced by the dam to all the environmental impacts, all of that in a sense comes into the issue of drinking water because the main rationale in a sense the, or the best rationale that has been found by the government at this point is the provision of drinking water. So we can make the link very directly with these uh, formal, uh, very visible conflicts as well. But so these ones have been acknowledged, these ones have been debated in the media, in uh, academic literature and so on, which is why for today I'm focusing more on the less visible conflicts. The, the rest of the time I, I want to keep you here tonight, I'll try to focus on two different examples um, to, to try and bring it to a more specific level. One, the first one I want to take is drinking water supply um, in rural areas, which will help me illustrating the kind of policy changes that have taken place over the past two decades. And again, that's an example of um, invisible conflict in the sense that the conflicts that arise at the local level in terms of access to water to a specific well, for instance, are not things which are actually discussed specifically either at the state or national level from a policy or law uh, perspective. The second case is an example of a more visible conflict, which is industrial use of groundwater, specifically in the case of a Coca-Cola bottling plant in the state of Kerala. This conflict has been mediated by various organs of the state. There's been a movement against the, the, the bottling plant, but there, also, there have also been uh, intervention by the courts, by the state government. And that kind of conflict shows us the potential um, of, the, the, helps us understand the kind of links that exist between industrial use of groundwater, drinking water, environmental aspects, agricultural aspects, and as well in the specific case I want to mention, health-related concerns. So in a sense, that brings in a much broader set of issues. The first example that I'm taking is, refers to the now uh, 
15 year long policy uh, changes that have been taking place for drinking water in rural areas. The, the title of the slide is called Swajadhara with a dash in between. The reason for that is because there was first a pilot project of the World Bank in the late 1990s, which was called the Swajal project. And that was then turned into national policy from 2002, 2008 in the form of something called the Swajal Dhara guideline. But the policy principles underlying both are more or less the same, and that's why I want to discuss them in one go. In a sense, it's, that helps us explain a whole decade of changes. So what is it that the Swajal Dhara schemes, uh, the, the projects implemented, looked like. Okay, now it's, it's something, we, we've moved beyond that at this point, but it explains uh, where we are today. First of all, it, the proposal was that it is the users themselves that should determine what kind of drinking water schemes they wanted to implement in their, for, for their own use. So it's not, not for their village, because it wasn't for the whole village, it was for themselves. That was done in the name of increasing the participation of users to the, the drinking water schemes, again, on the assumption that drinking water is uh, something that concerns everyone very directly. Now, the problem, the first problem to highlight is that the user group was in principle to be chosen by the village assembly, that means a meeting of the whole village. In practice, at least in all the visit I've been able to do, it was always self-selection, a group of people coming together and realizing that there was something to do, that there was a new project opportunity to be implemented. So in other words, there was hardly ever any women to start with on the committees uh, because it was usually the more powerful men of the village that were coming together to decide on the scheme, just one element of the problem. The choices by the users means that there was no allocation by the state. So in a sense, there was no planning of the schemes in terms of deciding which villages were the neediest villages at that point, or which were the people within one village that were most in need of um, getting access to new uh, water infrastructures. In case, for instance, there could have been hand pumps in certain parts of the village, but not others. That could have been planned, but the whole idea of these schemes was to let users themselves demand in policy terms what they wanted. The broader uh, underlying uh, proposal behind this was that the government should limit itself to the formulation of policy aims and then restrict itself to monitoring and evaluating. Note here, no enforcement of any policy proposals enforcement was left to be at the local level. So the, it's, in other words, it's a government withdrawal from some of the functions it had been performing over time. Now, the user group choice of schemes was not in a vacuum. Obviously, the government is still there to provide the policy framework that, again, immediately reminds us that the government withdrawing is not withdrawing entirely, but is withdrawing in part. Um, so that was linked to certain norms. The first one of them, and one of the most significant, was the willingness to pay of users, which means that users could decide on whatever scheme they wanted, but they had to pay 10% of, cap of the capital cost at the outset, before the implementation of the project, and they were made to pay full cost of the operation, the maintenance, and anything related to the replacement, let's say if the engine failed, um, the replacement cost would need to be borne by the villages. Now, what, does, what has that meant in practice? In practice, that has meant that water under these schemes is only provided to people who pay the 10% contribution capital cost in the first place. So everyone else is by definition excluded. That's how the scheme works. The problem is that in practice, that means that the poor are excluded. And in parts of the country where villages are made of different hamlets, then the hamlets uh, that contain mostly a poor population, which will happen in many cases to be also um, down in the caste equation. So for instance, Dalit hamlets will largely be excluded from the scheme at the outset. So it's not a question of the scheme not being, um, being unequal or equal, it's just funded on principles which uh, dismiss certain people at the outset. Second thing is that the choice of scheme was free. 
completely free in principle, but in practice, there has been a strong emphasis on individual uh, piped connections instead of the usual hand pumps that have been um, uh, put in most villages for many years by now by the government. So in a sense, what this does is that this increases the cost of building the scheme, that increases the 10% contribution that people have to uh, give, that's one thing, but so if you take that decision at the outset, it's fine. But mostly it increases dramatically the cost of running the scheme afterwards. The difference between running a scheme on electricity with an engine and so on and a hand pump are very significant. Third point is that there was a distrust of community taps, but so in the context of piped water supply, which is the equivalent in a sense of a hand pump, and a distrust of sharing of water among water users. Now, in, in practice, what this meant is that, uh, at least in the context of the Swajal project, the early pilot project for which we have a longer time period to see what has happened on the ground, um, community taps were always installed in the first place. People were told that they there was a need to provide both for individual and the, the, as in for individual connections and to the rest of the village. In practice, after a couple of years, all the community taps were always closed. The reason given by the committee overseeing the project, so those users, those so-called users, was always the same, which was that the villagers, the other villages, the community had not paid whatever they were supposed to pay, hence eventually they had cut off the supply. And it makes sense from an economic perspective because it was otherwise those users that had to bear the cost of providing water to the whole village. But the, the underlying point here is that these are users, it's a user committee, it's not the panchat or the local elected village assembly, um, which under the constitution in principle has control over drinking water at the local level. So that's where the problem arises in the sense that there's been a displacement from the elected um, representatives to those so-called user um, committees, which are in effect not able, even if they wanted to, they're not able to take over the functions of the panchayat. Um, the, the second point here was in terms of sharing of water, that's I, I found very significant, especially because we encountered that in Rajasthan, a very dry state where there has been a lot of solidarity at the local level, probably as in more than in areas that suffer less from water scarcity. And in certain villages, not in all villages, it has to be said, but in certain villages, the schemes were implemented in such a way that people were specifically told that they were not allowed to share the water they were getting from the scheme with their neighbors. Whether they were family, just neighbors, or otherwise they were not allowed to share uh, for fear of a penalty. So in a sense, it's instead of promoting better access throughout the village, what happens is that it is the people who are the users of the scheme that get better access. So it's good for a limited number of people, but that doesn't provide a broader policy answer to the need for better access to drinking water in villages. Now, just to give an illustration of uh, what the schemes have been in practice, so that was just to give the, an idea of uh, a tank and the, the infrastructure that's built for those projects. That's not what I wanted to focus on. That's just that's a typical case, so it's obviously much more expensive than a hand pump. But the, the second slide is to indicate that there is also scope for whatever success stories um, within a scheme that doesn't seem to have much potential in equity terms um, or, in, you know, or in terms of the realization of the human right for everyone within a given village. And the reason why there was scope uh, in practice for some success stories is because the scheme was implemented not just through these user committees I mentioned, but with the support, okay, that, I shouldn't use that word, of so-called support organizations, or in other words, NGOs coming to help the villagers implement the schemes. So it so happens at least to one organization, I know there may be other success stories, but this is one I know, um, an organization called Vanagna, working with Dalit women, so for the, the, the for Dalit women's rights, who happened to find itself as one of these support organizations. They decided to take that up as a way to finance their own work on uh, women's rights. And they realized that there was potential to do something with this. And the picture of this uh, closed well um, 
in, in, in a village in, the, in Chitrakut district um, in the southern part of Uttar Pradesh is the result of an organization taking up some mandates of the project, deciding which scheme to put forward, which scheme to implement, implementing the cheapest possible option in a, for the whole community in a Dalit uh, hamlet of the village where the rest of the village had done their own uh, piped scheme for themselves. So th that kind of sort of gives a, the, the contrast of the different things that can be done depending on who is involved. So that also brings another point, which is the problem with the withdrawing of the state. Um, depending on the kind of advice people get at the local level, they may not be all experts in terms of what kind of solution best fits their needs. If support organizations keep telling them that go for piped connections because you get better water access, it makes sense that most people will go for that. There, there is potential for something else as well as illustrated in this case. Now, um, the, broader, uh, the broader connection that this brings is in terms of the evolution of the policy framework. The emphasis on individual connection has the the impact, obviously, of sidelining the importance of hand pumps. In the first place, this doesn't do anything to anyone because for the people who do not benefit from the new schemes, they still have access to the existing infrastructure through which they have been accessing water. The understanding being that everyone has access to some water if they are alive. Um, so in the first place, there is no issue per se, but the problem comes with the withdrawal of the state from operation and maintenance costs, which means, which means that the hand pumps from now on, okay, that's been a bit a staggered implementation, but in principle it's been implemented for the past few years. From now on, the government is not supposed to chip in for the maintenance of existing infrastructure. So once a hand pump um, fails, that means the villagers have to pay for uh, its repair. So that's the first level of uh, the first policy issue that arises. Now we've moved, in a sense, many steps forward with a strategic plan for 2011-2022, which proposes virtually a virtual phase out of hand pumps by saying that we should move from 90% reliance on hand pumps today to 10% by 2022. And the f that will be made up through increased reliance on the individual connections. So that uh, whatever, I, whatever I was explaining in terms of the specific projects at the local level and the kind of pilot projects there has, in fact, feeds in into a much broader policy framework. But there is obviously no, um, okay, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but there is no discussion of what kind of policy framework is implemented at the local level and the way in which the government thinks about mo moving forward in the longer term. Now, a, m a more, um, 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 another, another concern which goes back to the local level is the issue of replacement cost. Now, the problem that I've been able to identify in all the villages I've visited is that while people are usually willing and or able to pay the monthly charge that represents the cost of pumping the water and maybe the minor repairs or paying the person who will go switch on and switch off the pump, in not a single village had anyone um, thought about, as in not uh, invested into um, a fund that would be able to pay for a major repair. And so what happens when there is a major repair needed is always that the scheme ends up being disused. So these schemes uh, where the replacement costs are to be, be borne by the users in, print, in practice do not work because the money is not there um, at the local level and there is no planning in terms of uh, policy planning at the local level to make sure that these are uh, sustainable scheme in terms of the long term. I've already mentioned that the user committees are not uh, directly, were not directly part of the panchayat. What I want to emphasize here is that this was something which was really obvious in terms of being not particularly within the legal framework. So in the meantime, that means over the past decade, the user committees have increasingly been brought back within the panchayat system. But what's interesting is that we now have, at least in certain states, um, a scheme whereby the panchayat, so again, the elected uh, village body has a water committee, and to that you append uh, a certain number of so-called users who are individuals um, 
who have usually been part of these paying schemes, who get appended to the existing um, democratically elected uh, committee as additional members. So in a sense, it's a kind of a dilution of the governance frameworks that exist um, that's been implemented over time. Um, last point in terms of the practical implications of the kind of policies that are being implemented is that when the government withdraws, it not only withdraws from provision of water services, but it also withdraws from uh, adjudicating any disputes that may arise as a result of the new scheme. So in a sense, however bad accountability was earlier, and there were obviously huge problems with accountability through the public sector, now the problem that we're facing is that that layer of accountability has simply been withdrawn, and people are left, left to fend for themselves at the local level. So in a sense, what we get here as kind of gaps in the legal and policy frameworks, which people can fill at the local level if they so want, if they so manage, but the, the state itself decide not to get involved anymore at any level. Now, just briefly to put that into the broader picture, I won't uh, go into the, the detail of these various policy documents I've put here on the slide. Um, there has been over the past 15 years a stream of policy reforms that have been uh, proposed in the form of policy documents, administrative directions, or pilot projects, as the first it started with a pilot project. Um, what is important to note here is the fact that okay, it's been a mix of national and international agencies working together in a sense on a similar set of principles, which is not what we would expect because we are always told that water is a local issue that reflects local concern, hence the principles for any reforms that would be implemented should be alongside, al along the lines of something that is uh, very much driven by local concerns. Um, and so th that's one of the issues. And the second issue is the fact that the pace of the reform, the pace of change has increased dramatically. And that's uh, borne out by the documents. Some, there are more documents than this, but the ones I've highlighted here. While the changes started slowly, in a sense, in the late 1990s and early parts of the last decades, in just the past four years, we've had two major um, new policy frameworks being thrown, um, thrown at the, the country, as in all the states, in a sense, um, which which still build on the same principles that were introduced in the 1990s, but take them, in, in, in a sense, it's fast-forwarding the implementation throughout the country. Now, the, uh, sorry. The, the issue um, here is that these reforms have been entirely driven by the executive, and there has been absolutely no input from either the legislative assemblies at the state level or parliament at the national level. That is, in a sense, the biggest problem that needs to be highlighted from this slide. Because water being recognized as a fundamental right or human right, one would expect that one of the first tasks of legislative assemblies or of, um, the legislature in general would be to address issues related to drinking water. Interestingly, they have, there has been a lot of water law reform in the country, over the, in India, over the past 10, 15 years. None of them have directly addressed drinking water, at least none in the sense of the nitty-gritty uh, that I've tried to highlight here. The only thing that we have is all these policy documents, uh, largely at the national level. And these documents have neither been discussed or debated uh, in the legislature, nor been widely uh, debated either at the state or national level. So in a sense, these are really things coming out of the executive uh, at a rapid pace without a process of policy change being uh, discussed and debated in, at any uh, particular level. As far as the local level is concerned, it's very clear that people are not part of the discussions concerning policy changes. They understand policy changes once they reach them in the form of these specific projects uh, that come in with a given uh, set of principles. At that point, they can react and relate to the policy changes, but there is nothing beyond the actual implementation of the policy. Now, let me turn to the second example, which is uh, the Coca-Cola bottling plant in Plachimada. Which, has, which is now a case which has been discussed widely throughout India and 
internationally. It's one of many bottling plants uh, for soft drinks and bottled water. What's interesting is that we are talking bottled water, hence we're also talking drinking water at some level. It's a plant which, was, uh, which started production in 2000, having received all the necessary clearances. But maybe the reason why it's more interesting uh, for our purposes than other similar bottling plants in India or maybe elsewhere in the world is because in Kerala, the framework for decentralization has been relatively better implemented, at least up to a certain extent. And the panchat in that case, or the village assembly, had the right at that point to issue the license and decide on the renewal or non-renewal of the license for the bottling plant, which is not something that uh, can be said for the whole country. So in a sense, it's a very positive development where a, a local village assembly can decide on what should happen in terms of industrial development, not just in terms of actual drinking water supply to people. Now, uh, what happened in, from 2000 to 2003 is that there was an, an increasing number of controversies, uh, villagers starting being happy, especially the farmers, uh, the neighboring farmers around the bottling plant, and eventually the panchayat decided not to renew the license. What this has led to over the past decades, nine, ten years, is a strong campaign that has been uh, maintained by people of the area. But, okay, the campaign that would be that there are campaigns against, let's say, various other bottling plants for the kind of problems that I'm going to highlight. So that's not uh, the specificity. The specificity is that this has also been litigated in first the High Court, twice in the High Court, and now it's uh, pending in the Supreme Court. And the state government, that is the government of Kerala, has also been very active in trying to find solution to this conflict at its own level. And I'll get back to that in a second, because in, in a sense, the, the problems that are highlighted here is that the, the different organs of the state at their own different levels have all tried to pitch in and address different aspects of the dispute. Now, first of all, what are the issues arising in the context of this uh, Plachimada um, bottling plant? First, there is an issue of access to drinking water, uh, linked also to health, uh, concerning the diminishing water quality in the area and the falling water table, which has affected access to drinking water for people living nearby. Secondly, there are environmental issues, and that's another reason why this case is particularly significant, which we may not find everywhere else, because for some reasons which are not completely clear yet, the owners of the plant decided that the sludge, um, as in the, the, the waste, the waste created by the process of um, making the soft drinks was something which they could uh, give to farmers under the guise of manure. It's not clear whether that was done deliberately or not, but in any case, that manure uh, for fields ended up being full of uh, cadmium and other heavy metals, which means that there have been significant negative environmental impacts, not from the plant itself, but in a sense from the distribution of the sludge in the neighboring fields. But, so that immediately gives a broader uh, dimension to the conflict. There have been also issues of access to irrigation water. That makes sense if the uh, water table has fall, fallen. But the point here is that uh, Palakkad district, which is a district within which the, this plant is located, is the so-called rice bowl of Kerala. So in a sense, agriculture is the main issue in terms of, for, for most people uh, within the region. And indeed, the, the next issue which arises in one related to uh, agriculture again, which is that there have been diminishing employment opportunities in the area because of falling water table, which means less, uh, uh, fewer crops, hence uh, all the landless uh, manual workers, uh, farm workers, have been finding it more difficult to find employment there. So in a sense, what's interesting is that it's not just about the plants being there, closing, not closing, the people employed in the plant itself. There are issues related to water directly, to the environment, and also livelihood issues which go beyond the impact of having the plant or not having the plant in the panchat. Now, what are the lessons from um, the, uh, some, a case which is still very much an ongoing case? First of all, in legal terms, um, there is a basic problem in the sense that the existing rules 
that give landowners complete control over groundwater are not suited to resolve the kind of conflicts that can arise when a, thing, a given landowner decides to, in, in effect, over-extract groundwater. The neighboring farmers, whether, whether it's an industrial concern or whether it's another use of groundwater, the neighbors never have a say, in a sense, in the amount of water that can be extracted. That comes down to rules which were laid down, uh, laid down in the 19th century, so in a sense the rules we have in this country, which work fine for the kind of climate we have in this country, but which have really never worked for the kind of um, hydrological conditions um, in India. But these are the rules which are still in place, and these are the rules which, in a sense, give rise to the kind of conflicts that are visible in the context of the Plachimala dispute. Now, what's interesting is that um, there has been a search at various levels to find, uh, for, uh, for finding new solutions to the dispute uh, that's the reason. First of all, the first judge that looked at the issue in the High Court decided that the actual extraction of groundwater was illegal. That was going a bit too far, probably, so the, the next sex of judges that looked at it decided that the first judge had got it wrong. But what's significant is that the first judge tried to find a new rationale for um, doing something about a problem, which is an, an actual problem that had to be addressed. And he also tried to think in terms of giving groundwater a new legal status, which would <coughs> remove it from the direct control of landowners. So again, that's been dismissed by the High Court for the timing. It's sitting in the Supreme Court, so there is no uh, resolution to that part of the dispute. In terms of what the government of Kerala has done, that's also been extremely instructive. In a sense, they started um, by setting up a so-called high-power committee to look into the aspect of compensation, so that there was a, an understanding that there was a need, uh, as in that there were um, damages that needed to be compensated so that uh, the Coca-Cola company has been very unhappy that the fact that the government took a stand in the first place, so that's something which will have repercussion for a long time, I guess. And after that committee gave its report, finding all sorts of um, uh, problems among the ones, uh, some of the ones I've highlighted um, here, um, the government decided to introduce a bill to set up a separate tribunal for the compensation of damages arising in the Plachima Dake. So what we see here is that it's a state government that feels the need to do a special effort that um, in terms of introducing a new legislation to adjudicate a single uh, conflict, which at the end of the day is not a major conflict in the sense of being large scale, but it's a major conflict in social and political terms. And for the timing, there is no... Um, implementation of the bill, uh, in fact, it's not even become law because there have been disputes in terms of the power of the state government to come up with this kind of um, separate tribunals for compensation. But so, that's, so it, it may well be that nothing will happen in practice, but the fact is that the state government itself has tried to do whatever it thought it could do, uh, whatever it saw in its power to do, to come to a different kind of solution uh, to the problem. Um, the third point, in terms of lessons from this case is that uh, there is a problem in terms of planning, of planning of industrial use of groundwater, or, or probably of water generally, but specifically of groundwater, and which would, at in a sense, what at least one thing we would at least hope for is that um, no industrial use of groundwater would be implemented in areas that are um, relatively dry or where groundwater is becoming scarce. Interestingly, while Palakkad district is the rice bowl of Kerala, the specific area of the district where the bottling plant of Plachimada is located is the driest area of the district. So it's very interesting to see how th that kind of issue arises, which could have been avoided in term with a broader plan um, being put in place. Now, to put the uh, two examples together, and, um, Briefly, what, what are the lessons we learn from these case studies, in a sense? First of all, um, the courts have been telling us for the past two decades on an increasingly frequent basis that there is a fundamental right to water in India. So even though it's not in the Constitution, now it's well established that there is a human right to water. In practice, the actual practice of the government 
in either in terms of policy documents, in terms of what's implemented at the local level, so in specific villages, is that water is seen as a basic need, and that really is the difference between the human rights and the basic needs need, needs to be emphasized here, and a basic need rather than a social right. So there is, there is even one policy document which specifically admonishes the, the people of India for having misunderstood water as being a social right rather than an economic and basic need. So th that's, that we, even ha we have it in written form. Um, second point is that all these drinking water uh, reforms, as I mentioned, have been done without any legislative input. The, the problem is that that means that in terms of the regulation of drinking water, there is no legislation that allocates rights and obligations of the wat of water utilities, of providers of water at any level um, in, on, a, on a broad scale. Similarly, there is no legislation that specifically sets down any quality for drinking water. There are standards that exist, but they are not referred to in any legislative framework. Now, the, the problem is uh, the following, in the sense that as long as the government was providing water for everyone and implementing everything, it was understood, for instance, that the quality standards that had been put, uh, put out in the public domain, though not binding, would be the, the standards that the government would implement, and at worst, they could be held accountable for not meeting those standards, if not in a court of law, but at least in policy and political terms. Now, when we are moving towards provision of water through other actors, whether the private sector or just individual contractors, there is an absolute need to have some standards in place because otherwise there is a complete vacuum uh, which cannot be remedied um, by people in terms of their own access to water. Now, one, okay, I just mentioned it, but I haven't really mentioned it until now. One of the issues that arises was the underlying issues of all these reforms is whether we are moving towards privatization of water services. That's indeed one of the biggest debate in terms of water but interestingly, not in terms of water law. So the first thing is that the first thing to mention here is that the laws in place in India neither prohibit nor uh, contribute to the privatization of water services. In a sense, they are completely neutral. They were all uh, worded in such a way that you could do whatever you want. So it's not that the law itself uh, pushes or pulls in one specific direction. However, what we see through the policy documents, so again, it's not the law, but then it's a policy that drives the changes, is that there is indeed a push which is increasingly visible, even though privatization is not being pushed as an option per se. So in a sense, it's not anymore privatization per se is good, but it's more privatization through different means or through different, um, or in, in piecemeal fashion. In rural areas, um, the strategic plan that I already mentioned specifically calls for um, uh, private sector actors to be involved in rural water supply. That's something completely new. So that's something which, again, one would hope to be seen discussed in the legislature at whichever level that is, rather than just introduced um, in policy documents. In urban areas, what we see now is that, as opposed to the proposals for um, so-called big, big bang privatization of water services as was implemented firstly or mostly in Latin America in the 1990s. Um, we now have uh, task-specific privatization implemented. That's, for instance, the case in Delhi where metering, billing, um, very specific tasks within the water utility have been privatized. And we also uh, see privatization on a geographical basis in the sense of pilot project in certain specific areas of a city. Um, possibly as a prelude to broader privatization, but possibly also as um, in terms of simply area-specific privatization. Now, all this talk of either privatization or decentralization or participation by users gives a sense that the state is withdrawing from provision and really limiting itself to a, regulatory, a distant regulatory role, again, without getting involved in accountability enforcement at the local level, and so on. That withdrawal is, in fact, not a reality. So there is another side to the law and policy um, debate, and it's one that really needs to be put in 
parallel because it influences probably just as much, if not more, what's actually happening and will happen in practice. So in a sense, the state still very much maintains its presence, but it's it's in different forms. It's starting to take a different shape and form. And one of the, the one easy case to refer to is that so-called uh, proposal for interlinking of rivers. It's a mammoth um, ID, okay, no, it's a mammoth project the, uh, that would uh, build hundreds of major canals and dams to link the different river basins within the country. Now, interestingly, and the reason why I'm bringing it here today is because the Supreme Court, the, that project was, has, was mooted quite a long time ago. It was given a, a kick by the Supreme Court in 2002. In the meantime, given lots of opposition, the state had started to be less uh, prominent in terms of pushing it forward. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the Supreme Court has come back and admonished the state, as in the government, for not having done enough and told the government that it was time to implement this project on uh, war, f um, war footing uh, path. Now, the issue is that, that also highlights something very interesting is that policy making happens within the executive, uh, legislative developments do not happen in a sense, for instance, with drinking water where parliament is just not involved. The courts also get involved in something that's between policy making and law making, as in the case of immense ideas like that, which definitely cannot be regulated through a court, but which in fact happen to be given uh, pushes uh, at various points. Now, overall, what it is that we get with the reforms that we've seen for the past um, 20 years, in fact, what we really see is that there, is, there are different pulls in different di directions. And the real problem is that there is no attempt has been made, or maybe no attempt can be made uh, yet to put it all, to bring it all under um, one direction. So we see the case law pulling in one direction. Uh, and now I'm not taking the case law concerning, for instance, that interlinking the rivers, but the more, the, the more I, I would say, progressive case law, the one through which the courts have recognized the fundamental right to water, the one where they have said that water is a public trust, in other words, um, a common resource rather than something that can be uh, privately owned. All of that the court has been doing um, consistently, in a sense, over the past couple of decades. Secondly, we have that whole stream of new laws that have been uh, adopted and Im progressively implemented. These laws concern, for instance, user participation, so that uh, reflects to what I was talking about, but user participation specifically in the management of um, canals and having nothing to do with uh, drinking waters. In a sense, they're very specific interventions that do not uh, take a broader perspective of what needs to be done. And the other laws, for instance, uh, provide, uh, propose the setting up of new institutions in the water sector. These new institutions um, being meant to take over part of the functions of the state. But these, lo these new laws do not tell us uh, what the state is supposed to do they only set up the new institution and give those new institutions a mandate. So in a sense, they don't resolve the problem of the fact that the state machinery is still very much there and is not going to disappear overnight. Whether that's the intent or not, the problem is that uh, we don't get a sense of what's supposed to happen. At the end of the day, uh, one of the things that's also visible uh, with these reforms is um, the diminishing role of the legislature even though lots of new water laws have been adopted. So in a sense, the, there are laws in sectors which may or may not be the most important, but definitely the ones that are the most important acknowledge universally uh, that is drinking water, that one has been com left completely untouched. Um, if I can go to my last slide. Um, the, in, where, does it, where does this lead us for the future? I guess the, the importance of water um, in social, political, policy terms is such that water will remain an issue of um, considerable importance and there will be attempts to make sure that the current reforms are worked on um, further down the line. So in terms of providing the, some of the positives that are rising at this point, the planning commission is for instance in the midst of an exercise of trying to define a new water strategy for the country trying to pull some of these different bits and pieces together. 
the planning commission can't do the job by itself, but that this is one new initiative in terms of bringing things together. Um, in terms of that privatization issue, which I mentioned again, which is one of the key issues in terms of what's debated in the public domain, what's clear is that water cannot drop out of the policymakers' attention because it is too significant for people on a daily basis. And what we're already seeing is that in urban areas, if not in rural areas where more work needs to be done, there is much more awareness, there is much more contestation also of propose, uh, policy proposals by the government. And that at least generates some sort of a level of debate, even though that may not reach all the way to um, the higher legislatures of parliament. And I couldn't resist finishing with a, a quote that I found a couple of weeks ago from um, the president, I can't remember if he's president or chairman of Nestle, uh, Peter Brabeck, who um, when interviewed about his, um, how Nestle um, is doing in terms of its uh, bottled water business, he said there is nothing to worry about because in any case it's only 0.0.0.0.9% uh, of water that's actually bottled water. Now, that may be true, I have no idea how the naked uh, figures, but it, it, he didn't say uh, the, what is the world consumption he understood there. But the point is, the point I want to make here is that, and that's a, a picture from the Plachimada uh, bottling plant. While that may be true, in the future it's clear that it won't be enough for Nestle or maybe uh, Coca-Cola, whichever I just happened to find this quote, um, to just assert that the fact of getting into the business of bottled uh, drinking water has no impact on the water sector. In fact, it has. The people of Plachimada, in a sense, have shown that there are ways in which um, the kind of conflicts that arise can be mediated. That doesn't mean that bottled water, uh, bottle, bottling plants should not be um, set up, but they should be set up under conditions which work both in terms of um, the water sector in general and the social and livelihood opportunities after that. Thank you very much. Philippe, esteemed uh, colleagues, friends, um, this is the vote of thanks. Now, I have to be honest with you, I had to Google what a vote of thanks was. And I got all sorts of, uh, as you do when you Google, you get all sorts of different ideas about what a vote of thanks is. I decided to ignore every single one of them. I, I really take this as, a, as an opportunity and indeed a privilege to thank Philippe for, for this I can't describe it how wonderfully solid, despite the fact that we kept on talking about liquids here, uh, such a solid delivery, such a, a wonderful arsenal of knowledge that we just witnessed here. So I just take this, I suppose it's a, it's a I think it's an enviable position to actually say that I, the vote of thanks is essentially a voice that represents all this, the body of people here, that you cannot speak because Philippe was talking ex cathedra, which means we shall take no questions. It's the privilege of the inaugural lecture, and I think we should respect this. Um, but it's me, my, my responsibility, and my privilege indeed to voice, and I'm pretty sure that it's one of the few times where I actually think that I can safely speak for, for a large number of people um, that we have to express our deepest thanks uh, to Philippe. And if I may say, uh, Philippe's... Um, you, start, it's, it's, you see how Philippe was and how is and how he behaves. Everything about Philippe is, is modesty, is humbleness. And I cannot tell you how this combination of incredible humble, this, is, this incredible self-effacing that goes on with Philippe contrasts with the CV he sent me. <laughs> My printer ran out of paper. I, 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 small font too, <laughs> an extraordinary thing, and 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 for this reason, it was it's all the more humbling, I think, for us uh, to be here. What what I what I I saw that Philippe was doing was this, except for the the obvious interdisciplinarity of the projects, is it's it's something 
he started with the concept of water as conflict. And we, all, we can all sympathize with that. This is what is happening. This is what is going to happen. We know that the world is, is going to be divided. Uh, it's not over religion. It's not over uh, politics. It's actually over water. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing how water seems to be the one thing that bridges the personal, that is the corporeal, our own bodies, with the global. It really, I mean, the other thing is air, of course. But uh, it's harder to to stop us from breathing, whereas it's quite easy to, to give us poison water. And, and what Philippe has managed to do, I think, during this lecture is, is bring this conflict, and especially the invisibility of the conflict, because that is exactly what Philippe was, was getting at. He didn't talk, and very specifically, you said, Philippe, that you're not going to talk about the visible conflicts, but you're going to look into the invisibility of the conflict. And, and what I was reading throughout his, his um, marvelous talk is precisely this conflict between, on one hand, what we call law, uh, in the sen sense of policy, in the sense of uh, regulation, and on the other hand, what might one dare to call justice. So the, the use of law that Philippe was presenting to us is a law that, uh, that talks about community, that talks about um, personal choice and the choices of the, the, the local communities and how they have the freedom to choose in theory. Uh, it talks about a law that talks about future plans, the 2020s. Uh, it talks about uh, a law at the same time, though, that uh, discourages sharing. And it talks about a law that excludes women. It talks about a law that excludes the hamlets. So when the law talks about right, um, Philippe talks about village water pumps, <laughs> and he talks about the poor in India in, 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 in the uttermost invisibility. So what, what, Philippe, what I felt that Philippe was doing throughout this lecture is bringing up this much needed horizon of what we can call justice, the understanding of justice for the marginal, for the excluded, for the, 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 the women, the, not the urban population that gets all the contestation and the heated debate. And, if I may say, this is an extraordinary thing because Philippe is a Swiss man. He's a white Swiss man who lives in London and Delhi. Uh, he speaks English with an Indian rhythm, which we all find, I'm sure, uh, fascinating. But somehow he, he is the, the Western observer. Yet he manages to do that with such a, a, an ex extraordinary modesty and, and, and conviction and efficiency. I mean, you, you could see that there was nothing romanticized about his understanding of India. There was nothing idea, idealizing. He didn't even mention the word justice. I'm the one who keeps on idealizing here. He stuck to law, but it's, a, it's this struggle of, of avoiding to be idealistic or avoiding to romanticize that I think Philippe has totally won. And, and because you, you, know, you, you saw how, for example, he, was, he, he didn't say that uh, decentralization, localization is a good thing. We need the law. We need the law to come back and give us strength to work through all these things. So I'm full of awe, in a sense, uh, because Philippe manages to straddle this incredibly vertiginously fragile path between continents, shall I say, between disciplines, between law and justice, between offending people who think, what do you know about how we live? And, and yet, doing it in this, I think, such a convincing and unassuming way. And I, I think Philippe, to a great extent, performs exactly what he, what he researches. And this is, this is a rare moment of academic honesty, in a way. He is what he does. He is what he writes about. And he is the, 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 the moment of, I, mean, I can I perfectly see Philippe writing in front of his window and, and, and taking all this all this in. And I think, at the same time, this is a, this is a it, it, Philippe to me represents SOAS. I've always been coming, when I was doing my PhD at Birkbeck, which is a bit of a bizarre place. It's kind of a hotbed of, of postmodern snobbism. And it's, well, you know, I fitted pretty well in there. But, uh, <laughs> true. <laughs> but then, then you, you know, you come to SOAS and you feel, ah, oh, I breathe, it's fine, it's nice. It's, you know, the cafe where you just sit around, you don't care, you know, people take off their shoes, great. I hope they still do that. And it's, it's this, this understanding of the SOAS is precisely this, this constant bridge between all these things. And, and I think Philippe, 
to, to so many, in, to so many, and on so many levels, he's exactly this bridge. And and may I say, Usha was talking about his chocolate cake. I will talk about his creme brulee, <laughs> and he's dull. I mean, it's 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 incredible. His his Indian cooking and his you know high uh, Swiss uh, bakery and patisserie, and it's it, it's it, he is that. He is he is all that. And I think that it's uh, it, it's again. I find this really really rather humbling. I mean, I, if I may, and please forgive my idiotic metaphor, but if I can say that his lecture was a bit like clear water, you know, the kind of Evian water, the Swiss side, perhaps. <laughs> it, was, it was so clear. It was, you know, you have to agree with me that you, you didn't need to, to look at these things. They were so the, the delivery was so incredibly clear. The viscosity of the water was full of these uh, how could, minerals of of of, uh, of wisdom and full of you know this kind of you know uh, liquid footnotes everywhere because he he talks from a really solid uh, position. So um, if I if I can um, take the perhaps the uh, I don't know, perhaps the, the, the presumption that I can talk on behalf of you and thank Philippe on behalf of all of us for this wonderful lecture and also for, I presume, making us distinctly thirsty. Um, and I'm informed that uh, there is a reception where not just water is going to be served on the first floor in the Brunei Gallery. So Philippe, thank you so much. <laughs>